Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this month's webinar. Our topic is exercise and injuries, and my name is Dawn, and I'm an exercise physiologist and health coach with Strategic Health Services. It is my pleasure to offer this topic. Uh, we will review common sports and exercise injuries, typical causes, recommended treatments, and recommendations for preventing these injuries. Um, there are three main types of injuries. Acute injuries refer to the first 24 to 48 hours after the incident or the injury occurs due to some sort of a traumatic episode uh, sustained either during exercise or sporting activity, uh, like a trip or fall or a hit or something. Uh, chronic injuries persist for a longer period of time, uh, showing little improvement or extremely slow improvement. And overuse injuries are caused by accumulated microtrauma or stress placed on a structure in the body, uh, whether it be bone, ligament, tendon, whatever. Some examples are tennis elbow and golf elbow. Now, acute injuries, they usually occur suddenly when playing or exercising. Some examples are sprained ankles, strained backs, fractured hands. Um, signs and symptoms of acute injuries include sudden severe pain, swelling, not being able to uh, place weight on a uh, leg or knee, ankle, foot, or an arm, elbow, or wrist, uh, or hand or finger that is very tender, uh, not being able to move a joint as you normally would be able to, and then um, extreme leg or arm weakness, um, or a bone or joint that is visibly out of place. Chronic injuries or chronic pain um, refers to the sort of physical injury that is persistent and long-lasting or constantly recurring over time. Many chronic injuries have mild symptoms like low-grade pain, or, and they're oftentimes ignored uh, for several months or even years. Now, ignoring these types of injuries um, can lead to persistent chronic injuries that are very, very difficult to heal. So. Um, you know, you want to treat them. You know, signs of a chronic injury include maybe pain when you play or exercise or a dull ache when you rest or even some swelling. Now, an overuse injury is any type of muscle or joint injury that's caused by repetitive trauma. They occur from stressing your joints, your muscles, your other tissues without allowing them to recover. For example, throwing a baseball at high speeds over and over can stress your shoulder or your elbow. Um, stress fractures occur, um, a stress fracture in which a bone breaks from pressure placed on it through activity. That's also common in athletes like runners from running all the time, putting repetitive pressure on um, your legs, ankles, etc. The um, pathophysiology of overuse injuries, it's basically based on the idea that tissues do adapt to stressors placed on them over time. And um, there's me mechanical fatigue with tendons, ligaments, and other soft tissues in your body. Um, and the fatigue usually leads to adaptation of these tissues. For example, if you want to build muscle, what do you do? You, you lift weights, maybe heavier weights than you normally do. Um, that breaks down the tissue. Um, the healing process causes them to heal and grow. So, you know, it's a normal process in the body, but in overuse injuries, the rate of injury simply exceeds the rate of adaptation. So basically, you didn't allow enough time for that tissue to heal. Um, now, overuse injuries can stem from training errors or technique errors. Uh, training errors occur when you take uh, on too much physical activity too quickly, going too fast, too soon in your exercise program. Um, technique errors uh, can also happen. So if you use poor form uh, when running or doing a sport or whatever, swinging a golf club or throwing a baseball, you might overload certain muscles or joints um, due to the, the poor technique. But there are also other causes. Uh, not using proper equipment, such as wearing properly fitting shoes or doing too much of the same activity, like possibly at work. Um, so risk factors for overuse injuries are age and muscle weakness. So although an overuse injury can happen to anyone, you may be more prone to this type of injury if you have certain medical conditions. 
Um, overuse injuries are also more likely the older you get, especially if you don't recognize the impact of aging on your body. And, you know, you may need to modify your routine sometimes. For these reasons, it is a good idea to talk to your doctor or your physical therapist or an exercise professional before starting a new exercise program or ramping up a current exercise routine. Now, they might offer you tips to help make the increased physical physical activity safer for you. Um, they might suggest if, you know, you have a muscle weakness in a certain area to strengthen that area to prevent um, injuries in the future. So let's quickly go over some common exercise and sport injuries. So abrasions are basically scrapes or cuts, bruises, everyone knows, blisters, etc. What a burner is is uh, it's also called a stinger, and it's a nerve injury that results from trauma to the neck and shoulder. This is typical in uh, contact sports like football. Um, compartment syndrome is a serious condition that can occur from uh, blunt force trauma, you know, getting hit by something, but also can be an overuse injury. And basically, you have different compartments in your body that contain groups of muscles, blood vessels, and nerves in your arms and your legs. And if there's swelling inside the compartment and the fascia that encompasses that compartment does not give, so it causes increased pressure and can, can damage the connective tissue that goes through the compartments. Um, DOMS, most people know what delayed onset muscle soreness is. It's very common and usually it's at its worst about two days after an extremely hard workout or a workout that's you know, harder than you've done in a long time. Uh, now, frozen shoulder uh, occurs when your joint capsule, which encases all the bones, ligaments, tendons um, in your shoulder, tightens and, and restricts the joint um, and prevents movement. And this can happen sometimes if you're recovering from some type of an injury and maybe you're in a sling or something. Um, impingement occurs when soft tissues get trapped, usually between bones, leading to pressure, inflammation, pain, and loss of function. Shoulder impingement is common in overhead sports, so think of swimming, uh, for example, where the tendons of the rotator cuff get caught between uh, the humerus, which is the bone of the upper body, and the acromion, which is one of the bones um, in your shoulder. Uh, patellofemoral pain or syndrome is basically knee pain, but especially when you're, you're sitting with your knees bent or you're squatting or jumping or walking up and down stairs, but especially going downstairs. You may also notice some occasional buckling and, and suddenly and unexpectedly your knee gives out on you. It's also common to hear popping, grinding, or possibly have a catching sensation in your knee. And in your knee, you have cartilage, which is called meniscus, that, and that can get bruised or torn, which can cause knee pain. A plica is also occurs in any joint, um, but it's a fold of tissue that can occur in your joint cap capsule. And you may not have any symptoms, but it may also cause a range of symptoms, including joint pain and inflammation. And then uh, lastly on this slide, dislocation or separation is basically the displacement of a bone from a joint. Um, it's common in fingers, thumbs, shoulders, hips. Sometimes you would have loss of motion, temporary paralysis if a nerve gets involved, um, swelling, sometimes shock. Um, dislocations are usually caused by a blow or fall, although unusual physical effort can cause one. Um, also, uh, some dislocations are due to a congenital um, malformation of the joint. All right, so here's some co some more common exercise and sports injuries um, that I'm sure most of us have heard of, but sprains and strains oftentimes get confused. A sprain is an injury to a ligament which connects bones to bones. A strain is an injury to a muscle or a tendon, and there are varying degrees of both, first, second, and third degree sprains or strains. First degree means that the ligament or tendon has been stretched but has not torn. And you usually have mild pain or some swelling and maybe some joint uh, instability, mild stiffness, difficulty jogging or jumping if it's in the lower extremity. Second degree means that there's a partial turn. Symptoms get a little more significant, you know, significant swelling, bruising, 
moderate pain, some loss of motion, trouble bearing weight if it's in your lower extremity. Third degree, there it's the most severe and there's a complete tear. So you'll have severe swelling, severe pain, um, instability in your joint, loss of motion, uh, trouble bearing weight if it's a uh, lower extremity, or moving the joint or the area can be quite painful. These types of injuries tend to be acute, but if not treated and allowed to heal, can also become chronic. Now, um, there's a group of injuries on here. Basically, I call them the itises. Basically, itis means inflammation of. So, tendonitis is the inflammation of a tendon. Bursitis is the inflammation of a bursa. Plantar fasciitis is the inflammation of the plantar fascia. Um, a tendon is the connective tissue that connects muscle to bone. So if you have a tendonitis, you will experience some pain with motion if you're using those muscles and moving a joint. A bursa is a small fluid-filled sac that's typically situated where there's friction, so between possibly a tendon and a bone or other places. But they're all over the body, in shoulders, elbows, knees, hips. Oftentimes, um, the doctor can tell by palpating um, where the bursa are if, they're, if it's a bursitis. <clears throat> Plantar fascia is the connective tissue on the bottom of the foot. And so if that gets inflamed, it's called plantar fasciitis. Um, now these can all be acute, but also become chronic. And oftentimes, uh, they do become chronic. And they can also be caused by overuse. So they can become, they are also overuse injuries. Now lastly on this slide there are shin splints, which basically refer to the sharp pains that you might have down the front of your leg. In most cases, shin splints um, are a result of overload on the tissues that connect the muscles to the shin bone, but they also may come from the small bone of your lower leg, the fibula. Um, this is an overuse injury, and it's very common in runners. And then, oh, I skipped one, lateral or medial epicondylitis, basically tennis elbow or golf elbow. It's the inflammation of the lateral or medial side of the elbow um, where, the, where the tendon attaches to the epicondyle of the bone. Anyway, these are typically overuse injuries. All right, let's look at some fractures. Basically, a fracture is a broken bone. There's many types, um, displaced, non-displaced, open, closed. Uh, displaced and non-displaced fractures refer to the way the bone breaks. In a displaced fracture, the bone snaps in two but doesn't really move and it stays in alignment. So if you look at the closed fracture on this picture, that is also a displaced fracture. Um, in a non-displaced fracture, the bone cracks either partway or all the way through, but um, again, doesn't move and maintains its proper alignment. Um, an open fracture, the bone actually breaks through the skin. A closed fracture, it doesn't. Now, another common fracture, especially in sports, uh, is clavicle fracture. And the clavicle is your collarbone. Uh, it's one of the main bones in the shoulder. And this type of fracture is very common and can happen um, with a fall onto an outstretched arm, which puts enough pressure on that bone where maybe it snaps. A broken collarbone can be very, very painful and make it hard to move your arm. Most clavicle fractures are treated by wearing a sling. However, you know, some may require surgery. And lastly, a stress fracture is a hairline fracture um, caused by repetitive application of a heavy force or load, such as the constant pounding of runners on the pavement or gymnasts, uh, dancers. This is an overuse injury, but if it's not treated, it can become more serious and can become a complete fracture. All right, briefly I want to talk about head injuries. You know, closed head injuries, basically um, there is, you know, no opening, a penetrating injury. It's, it's pretty self-explanatory. Something breaks through the, the skull, the scalp and, and possibly the skull. Um, but what I really want to focus on here is concussion, which is trauma-induced change in mental status with confusion. Some people have amnesia. You may or may not lose consciousness, but it can occur when the hit, hit hits an object or is hit by an object or when the brain is jarred against the skull um, with sufficient force to cause temporary loss of function in different centers of the brain. 
the injured person may again may or may not lose consciousness consciousness but is usually disoriented for a few minutes after the blow or the incident and while concussions usually resolve on their own without any lasting effects it can set the stage for a much more serious condition which is the second impact syndrome and basically that occurs when a person who has a concussion even a very mild one um, suffers a second blow before they fully recover and this can cause dangerous brain swelling uh, intracranial pressure and it can be potentially fatal All right, so here are some safety considerations for climate. I'm not going to go too deep into this, but heat exhaustion is a heat-related illness that occurs if you've been exposed to high temperatures. Often, is accompanied with dehydration. So without proper intervention, this can become heat stroke, which is a medical emergency that requires immediate medical care. The most important measure to prevent heat strokes and heat exhaustion is to avoid becoming dehydrated and avoid vigorous uh, physical activities in hot and humid weather. And um, frostbite is the exact opposite. The frostbite occurs when um, uh, tissues of the body freeze. Most likely it happens in your extremities, feet, toes, hands, fingers, nose, ears, etc. cetera. Um, but you know, usually if you recover nicely, but um, you can also cause some permanent damage if it's not treated properly. So proper clothing is really imperative based on the climate that you're exercising in. Um, material that absorbs sweat and whisks it away from your skin should be worn closest to the body. Um, if it's cold, you may want to wear layers, the top layer being waterproof or water resistant if needed. Protect your extremities with warm socks, gloves, scarf, even a face mask if appropriate. Uh, and lastly, altitude sickness occurs when you can't get enough oxygen from the air um, into your blood and to your um, through your blood vessels to the, your extremities or anywhere in your body. Um, it happens at high altitudes. Um, you might notice a headache going over a mountain or something like that. But anyway, if, if you have any medical conditions or you plan to hike at high al altitudes, it's important to discuss prevention um, with your doctor. Okay, so now um, let's talk about what causes injuries. Um, and mechanism of injury is basically the manner in which a physical injury occurs. Can be maybe a fall from a height or a collision on a playing field or you know ejection or being thrown uh, a distance. But the mechanism of injury is used to estimate the force involved in the trauma and that's the potential severity for the wounds or the fractures or organ damage, etc. And there's an old saying uh, that says it's not the fall that kills you, it's the sudden stop at the end. And that in mechanism of injury terms is known as a sudden deceleration. Now back to some high school physics. Force equals mass times acceleration. Okay? So the bigger the object or the mass or the larger the acceleration or deceleration, um, the higher the force and the higher the, gr the risk of injury. Um, and just uh, briefly want to mention about the projectiles. I think, you know, the only sport I can think of off the top of my head might be track and field. <laughs> um, but um, projectile, it's pretty self-explanatory. Now, also, um, muscle imbalances and poor posture can cause injury. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time on these. Now, muscle imbalance, um, what is a muscle imbalance? Well, uh, your human movement and function requires a balance of muscle length and strength between opposing muscles surrounding a joint and also um, left and right sides, so opposite sides. Now, muscle imbalances occur when the opposing muscle provides a different direction of tension due to either being tight or weak. Um, when a muscle's too tight, it tends to pull the joint in that direction. Um, for example, oh, one example of a muscle imbalance might be your quadriceps and your hamstrings of your knee joint. Um, and they perform flexion and extension, so opposite motions. An imbalance between the two could cause undue stress on your knee joint. A tight hamstring won't allow the joint to glide normally um, or fully extend 
which could put extra pressure on um, your quadricep muscle and your kneecap. So muscle imbalances or differences in muscle length or strength can occur also side to side, front to back. Um, most muscle uh, pain, musculoskeletal pain syndromes are caused by front to back differences um, or the imbalances surrounding a joint rather than side to side. Um, but two causes of muscle imbalances include repeated movements or sustained postures in one direction or a predisposition of muscles to be tight or weak. So an example of repeated motions is um, think of a grocery store checkout who's constantly pulling groceries with one arm in the same direction. Um, picture with for posture, picture a baseball player. Their typical posture standing out in the outfield, they have um, one hip hiked higher than the other, you know. Doing that often or for an extended period of time uh, can cause imbalances. Secondly, some muscles are more prone to being tight than others, such as your hamstrings, your piriformis muscle. Okay, tight hamstrings can cause low back pain. Uh, a tight piriformis can put pressure on your sciatic nerve and cause sciatica. Other muscles are also prone to weakness. Um, for example, one of your quad muscles, your vastus medialis, which holds your kneecap in place. Um, if that's weak, it can cause a patellar misalignment and hence knee pain. Um, weak rhomboids can cause your shoulders to roll forward, causing poor posture. So, you know, everything's connected here. So let's talk about posture. What is good posture and why is it important? Well, on, on this slide, it tells you why it's important, what it does. But posture is the position in which you hold your body upright against gravity while standing, sitting, or even lying. Good posture involves training your body to stand, sit, or lie in positions where there's the least amount of strain on your muscles, ligaments, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and again, good posture is important because it helps maintain alignment of bones, joints, decreases abnormal wearing of joints, stress on ligaments, um, muscle fatigue, strains, prevents back aches, etc. Okay, so this slide shows some good and some bad posture in both the sitting and standing positions. As you can see, um, it does appear that some muscle imbalances are present, but, but what came first, the muscle imbalance or the poor posture? It can really occur either way. Um, look at the gentleman on the top right, the, the third picture in the middle, okay? His shoulders are rolling forward. He probably has tight chest muscles and weak rhomboids, right? So um, anyway, that's just an example. Let's move on. Um, gait is your walking posture. Now the gait cycle is the way that we walk and run. It's divided into your stance phase where your foot is in contact with the ground and your swing phase where your leg is swinging forward. Posture is very important um, while you're walking too. So you know, an evaluation of your gait or a gait analysis might be a useful tool um, if you're an avid exerciser, especially runners. It's often, uh, this analysis is often used to determine what type of, of running shoes would be best suited for you. Um, but can also look at the joints above, you know, your knees, your hips, uh, to determine if there's any dysfunctions in movement uh, that may be causing or may put you at increased risk for injuries. Um, so to evaluate your gait, uh, if you're in physical therapy, the therapist may ask you to walk towards them or away from them, um, or you may be put on a treadmill and videotaped to, um, and there's a lot of software uh, out there that provides analysis. Now this is an extreme example of poor gait posture. Um, it shows some possible reasons for each area that's out of alignment. Again, it goes back to posture and muscle imbalance. Look at the shoulders. The muscles of the front of the shoulder and chest are weak, and the muscles in the back of the shoulder, the upper back, are tight. See, these shoulders, as opposed to the other ones I pointed out, are rolled backwards rather than forwards. So the tightness is in the back rather than the front. Um, look at the feet. Weak muscles on the front of your leg and tight calf muscles 
she is um, walking on tiptoes instead of heel striking. And so that's a muscle imbalance in the lower leg. OK, so now you, you have an injury. Something happens. You get injured. What do you do? Well, first, um, evaluate the injury, see how, you know, how bad of an injury it is. Um, but for any acute injury, the immediate treatment is you know, rest, ice, compression, elevation. Rice, OK? So rest means uh, if you've injured your foot, ankle, or knee, take the weight off of it. Maybe you need to use a crutch. Um, ice, basically, you want to ice it for 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off. So that's four to eight times a day. You can use a cold pack, an ice bag. But again, take it 20 minutes off. You want to avoid cold injuries. You don't want frostbite from treating an injury with ice. Compression, basically putting even pressure on the joint to help reduce swelling. Now you can um, take your ice and wrap your wrap it in an elastic wrap around, say, your ankle, and get both compression and ice at the same time. Um, and then elevation, put the injured area up on a pillow or above heart level to help reduce the swelling. So when do you see a doctor? Okay, well, if the pain is uncontrollable or you can't control the swelling or if it's an injury that's just not improving um, with self-treatment, please, you know, in a day or two, you should start to see some improvement. Um, if not, go see your doctor. All right, so now let's talk prevention, okay? Um, if you have muscle imbalances, maybe you had your posture evaluated and you can see some mus muscle imbalances, correct them. Improve your posture. Have your gait evaluated. Um, use proper equipment and proper footwear. Um, for example, use protective gear if it's recommended for any sport or exercise that you do, such as knee pads, helmets, shin guards. Wear shoes that are specific to the activity that you're doing, because not all shoes are made the same. Don't play basketball or tennis in running shoes, and vice versa. Address your deficiencies. Um, maintain the areas that are normal. So if, if you are, are good, your upper body is balanced, you know, you want to um, stretch your entire body every day, and you want to work your entire body at least twice a week again with some sort of a resistance, right? But if you have areas that are weak, you want to work the weaker areas more often to strengthen that area three to four times a week rather than two times a week. Um, if you have areas that are tight, um, you should be stretching them more than daily. You, maybe you want to focus on stretching those certain areas two to three times a day. When you're stretching, hold those stretches 10 to 15 seconds and, and repeat. Uh, two or three times. So it's all about working the areas that need improvement more often than what is recommended and more often than the other areas. Some general recommendations, um, everyone's heard this, warm up and cool down. Progress your workout slowly, have a balanced workout, include cardiovascular exercise, muscle conditioning and stretching, you know, work those areas that you need to improve and cross-training, which basically means change it up. Don't do the same type of exercise all the time. Um, it's even recommended nowadays uh, baseball players, especially kids, you know, should also consider playing um, basketball or some other sport that has a different motion. You need to change it up so that you're not always working the same muscles and areas of your body in, in the same direction. How do you avoid sports injuries? Make sure you're using proper mechanics. For example, uh, have your running gait, your jumping uh, form evaluated. Uh, if you're a baseball player, or soccer player, whatever sport you choose, have your mechanics evaluated by an expert. Wear the correct footwear, clothing, and safety gear. Don't become dehydrated. Um, drink before you feel thirsty. A drink before your workout, during, and after. And don't be a weekend warrior. Don't just work out for multiple hours on the weekend. You know, you're going to strain yourself. You're going to cause injuries, overuse injuries. Um, know your limits. Listen to your body. Your body knows. It'll tell you when you've had too much. So um, 
that this concludes uh, the webinar, and I would like to thank everyone for joining us. Um, remember to check out My Pathway to Health for all of your resources for meeting your goals. And if you have a health coach available to you, reach out to your health coach. We are more than happy to help you set your exercise goals to help you prevent injury. Thank you so much for joining, and I hope you have a great day.